There are films that have some great concepts at the core of their story. A really intriguing premise, a plot device with huge potential, something unique, interesting and engaging, at least on paper. And then there's films that just can't seem to make that concept work quite so well when they transition from script to screen. One such example, in my opinion, is the 2006 fantasy romance film The Lake House, starring Sandra Bullock and Keanu Reeves. This is actually a remake of a South Korean film. It tells the story of two people, a physician, Kate Forrester, played by Bullock, and an architect, Alex Weiler, played by Keanu Reeves, who have both lived at different time periods at a lake house. Alex is in 2004, and Kate is in 2006. Alex arrives at the lake house and checks the mailbox, which has a letter from Kate addressed to the new occupant. What he doesn't realise is that Kate actually sent the letter from two years in the future. For whatever reason, which the film makes no attempt to explain, the mailbox is somehow magical and allows them to communicate back and forth across time. In that respect, it's a bit like frequency, except instead of ham radios, they're using letters. It seems only fitting to have Christopher Plummer in this film because, as this is a love story involving time travel, it makes for a nice connection to the 1980 film Somewhere in Time, which I also recently reviewed, which Christopher Plummer is also in. Now, the idea of romance being told across time in this manner is actually genuinely clever and something that I was interested in seeing after I was told about this film, because I'd actually never watched this movie until last night. This is another recommendation from a subscriber. The problem, fundamentally, is that despite the fantastic chemistry between Bullock and Reeves, the film executes the story so poorly I think this film should be cited as an example of how to butcher a great idea. The two characters correspond across time for about two years. For Alex, this begins when he first moves to the lake house in 2004. And for Kate, this begins in 2006, after she's left the lake house and begun working in a hospital in Chicago. Specifically, after she tries to save a man who was killed in a car accident because she's so shaken by this event, she goes by herself to get away from it all at the lake house where she used to live, which is now abandoned. This is where she first discovers that the mailbox contains a letter from Alex. Of course, the man who was killed in the car accident is Alex. This is the reason that when they try to meet for dinner in 2006, he never shows up, because he's dead, obviously. Now, this film is nowhere near as complicated as a time travel story like Primer, for example, but because of how poorly structured the story is, my explanation of how the whole thing works might actually be more confusing than it should be, so please forgive me in advance. Alex and Kate exchange personal details and life stories and experiences across time in their letters. Alex learns where the Kate from 2004 will be, and he eventually meets her at a party, but of course, she doesn't know who he is at this point. They dance together and share a kiss, but this version of Kate is not ready for a relationship with him. Now, at a later point in the film, 2006 Kate and 2004 Alex agree to meet up for a meal at a restaurant. Alex makes the reservation for two years into his future, and so all he has to do is make sure he keeps his appointment after two years but he doesn't show up because he was killed in the car accident at Daly Plaza in 2006, the day before Kate returned to the lake house to get away from it all and where she first found Alex's letter. The obvious plot hole at this point is that 2006 Kate should have recognised Alex in the hospital when she was trying to save his life. She did, after all, dance with him and kiss him in 2004. Perhaps he was horribly disfigured in the car accident, who knows, but whatever. Now, at the end of the film, a lot of people get very confused about which character is in which year. So Kate meets Alex's brother and sees a drawing of the lake house and discovers that Alex has been dead for two years. She realizes only at this point that Alex was the man who died in the car accident. This means that if Alex died in 2006, then Kate is now in 2008, 
they are still separated by two years. The issue that throws many people off is that the film doesn't expressly state that Kate is now in 2008, when there really needed to be just one line of dialogue to state this. Anyway, Kate hurriedly returns to the lake house and begins conversing with Alex in one final letter. She warns him not to try to meet her at Daly Plaza in 2006, but instead to wait two years and meet her at the lake house, presumably two years to the day. No specific date is given, but whatever. So what she's instructed him to do is to meet her at the lake house in 2008, where she is. And that's how the film ends. They end up happily together in 2008 because she gave him the information he needed to avoid the accident. There are some logical inconsistencies in how the plot device works, however. For starters, what Kate has done here is create a paradox. Alex originally died in a car accident in 2006, but if 2008 Kate has now prevented that accident, then her 2006 self would never have been depressed at being unable to save his life, and therefore she would never have gone back to the lake house to get away from it all. She therefore would never have checked the mailbox to find Alex's first letter. Thus, their entire two years of corresponding across time would never have happened. And thus, in an absolutely Mobius loop of causality, Kate couldn't have ever sent that letter back warning Alex in the first place. This film makes no sense. <laughs> Apologies if that was a long, head-scratching explanation. But the time paradoxes aside, this is ultimately a love story, and the technical details obviously do play second fiddle to the romantic development between the two characters. It's just that they are painfully distracting. Now, much like Frequency, you do have to grin and bear some of the logical gaps. But Frequency doesn't have nearly as many, and Frequency did it all much better. It is unfair to compare the movies, obviously, because they're different genres. Frequency is a science fiction thriller with action elements and mystery elements as well, whereas The Lake House is a romantic fantasy film. But they both contain a similar plot device, and regardless of the genre, the plot device must make sense in the context of the narrative, otherwise, suspension of disbelief becomes extremely difficult. Frequency achieved this, The Lake House in my opinion, does not. For starters, the writing and frequency was very good, the characters were engaging, there was plenty of drama and time-bending consequences to deal with, and the film benefits from being paced extremely well. By comparison, The Lake House has got to be among the worst paced films I've ever sat through. It is painfully slow and plodding, filled with pointless scenes, with Kate wallowing in self-pity at her self-induced loneliness. There's a totally extraneous scene that should have been cut out of the movie between Alex and his brother, Henry Weiler, played by Eben Moss Backrack, talking about the shape and design of the lake house which their father designed. And the dialogue is so clunky and bland. As someone from an editing background, I could have trimmed at least 15 to 20 minutes out of this film and little to nothing of any substance would have been lost. Alex also has an assistant, Mona, played by Lynn Collins, who seems to have a romantic interest in him, but her character is underdeveloped and ultimately doesn't serve any real purpose in the story and is then discarded and forgotten about later in the film, as is Kate's other love interest in the story, Morgan Price, played by Dylan Walsh. Much of the film's runtime is whiled away with cutesy back-and-forth voiceovers between the two characters, which are meant to be their letters, of course, and Alex's story arc concerns his relationship with his estranged father, Simon Wyler, played by Christopher Plummer. Now, as always, Plummer, being the incredible actor he was, delivers a fantastic performance with anything he's given. But there's another scene that has nothing to do with the story. On his deathbed in the hospital, Simon talks to Alex about architecture and light, and specifically how an architect must respect nature, but it has nothing to do with the story, and it has zero payoff later in the film. It just feels like an entirely esoteric and irrelevant moment. 
even the scenes where Alex's career or plans with his brother are discussed, none of it has anything to do with his relationship with Kate. We understand that he's kind of working on something, but it's all just kind of undefined. And this comes down to the film's next biggest problem. There's zero sense of urgency to anything unfolding on screen. I mean, sure, Alex is eventually going to catch up to 2006. We know he's going to die. But I couldn't tell if the filmmakers didn't want the audience to figure out that Alex was the guy killed in the car accident in the beginning of the film or not. I mean, it's not exactly a big twist. I figured out that it was Alex in like two seconds after the accident happened. I knew the reason Alex didn't show up for the meal with Kate in 2006 was because he was dead. So it was kind of yawn and groan inducing to watch Kate only figure it all out at the end of the movie. So this big epiphany at the climax just feels meh. It's totally deflated. It has zero impact. Even the final rush for Kate to get to the lake house and send the final letter to Alex and Alex rushing to get her letter, it's all too little too late. Moreover, why hadn't Alex read her warning letter before he had put all of her letters up in the box in the attic? <sighs> Seems kind of strange. For me, much of the film contained so many redundant, long, drawn out and painfully slow and uninteresting scenes that it just felt like there was a lot of filler in there. This feels like a two-hour movie despite only being 99 minutes long. Again, the idea was great. There was huge potential here in a story about two people corresponding with letters across two different time periods. A fascinating concept. But there are major problems with logical inconsistencies due to the time travel and how it works that weren't resolved in the writing process and should have been. There's too many pointless scenes unrelated to the story. The pacing is too slow. Sometimes the delivery of dialogue is excruciatingly slow. The story has no forward momentum or build up to a major conclusion. There needed to be a greater sense of impending disaster in the sense that the audience knew Alex's death was imminent as he moved closer to that moment in 2006 and that his death had to be averted somehow. Instead, it all kind of just unfolds slowly, gradually, and without any real sense of urgency or anticipation. And it's not until the end, when Kate figures it all out, almost by accident, that we finally get the climax. And there's a nice happy ending, of course. Alex is saved, but unfortunately, there's just not enough good stuff here for me to recommend The Lake House. To me, it felt like an example of how to squander a good idea. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching. Take care, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. The Dave Cullen Show is made possible by you, my generous subscribers. If you'd like to support my work, head on over to my subscribe star linked below in the description box. And for a pledge of as little as $1 per month, you can help to keep the show going. I'm also doing one-to-one -one monthly subscriber chats. Thanks again. Take care.